Ephesians. And so we're going to, to do a little August tour uh, through Ephesians, and we're going to be focused on this particular theme of growing up in Christ, growing up in Christ. When we were on the road together in Ireland, well, one of the reasons why we did this together as a family was because not only just to gather us together after a long time of not being together, but our girls are on the cusp of adult life, uh, going out to university this coming fall, and, um, and uh, Rosie, our youngest, is going to be married next summer, uh, which is a, a lovely thing as well. And so we realized, wow, we're really on the cusp of something new. We're on the cusp of, of uh, maturity, right? A new phase of life, a new stage of life for the girls as they launch out on their own. But guess what? Maturity uh, is required for us too, for Mandy and me, because it means something different to parent at this new, new stage. And it was so wonderful to get back together again. I'll say this, though. We had a couple of moments. We had a couple of moments. How many of you have had a couple of moments before in your own families? Yeah, right. We all have them. Yes, thank you, Paul. Welcome to both of you as well. It's great to see you. Yes, we have moments in families. And oftentimes it's related to maturity and going through new stages and, and that being an unpredictable thing and it can unsettle everything, and, and, it, and it can kind of disrupt relationships. You've been relating to each other in one way, now you're going to be relating to each other in a new way, and you're trying to catch up with that and, and honor that for what it is. And so this is what we're talking about ourselves. Maturity. What does maturity look like in life? What does it look like in the Christian life specifically? Ephesians has a lot to say about that. Um, next slide, please, Kirsten. I You'll know this. This is my refrain uh, in many of uh, the teaching moments that we have here on a Sunday morning. I'll open things out, uh, the readings out, and I'll say, well, what are your impressions? What's the one thing that's standing out for you in our reading this morning? I'm not going to do that this morning, but I'll say this. As I was reading the passage from Ephesians this past week, this was the passage that really stood out for me, right in the center of our second reading from Ephesians. Now, Ephesians, I think that we'll know this, is a letter that was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to the church at Ephesus years after he had helped to found that church and plant that church. He had had a really effective ministry there for two solid years. Now, Ephesus is right on the southwest coast of the Aegean Sea in present-day Turkey. That's where it's located. And so Paul is writing, likely from Rome, in prison at Rome, back to the church at Ephesus, and what he's wanting to do is to remind them of all the stuff that they already know as a, as a way of encouraging them. Now, it's one thing to know something kind of intellectually. It's another thing for it to just be so ingrained in your life that you're living out of it constantly. There's a difference between the two, isn't there? And as we know, it's very difficult to always remember and to be living out of the good news that we know about Jesus. Because there are all kinds of pressures at work in the world that we live in that deny it and work against it, right? And so even from Sunday to Sunday, day to day we can forget. And we can feel like we're being tossed about to and fro and we're forgetting the most foundational things. Well, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and he's helping them to remember all the stuff that matters. This particular passage was just fascinating for me. It paints an incredible picture of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let me just read it. To each one of us, grace. Oh, what is grace? This incredible, unmerited favor that comes from God that's poured out for us in a complete surprise. No one saw it coming. No one imagined that God would bless us in such an abundant way. This incredible outpouring of blessing and grace. This has been given to us as Christ has apportioned it himself. This is why it says, and Paul is quoting here from Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. There's the language of gifts there again. What does he ascended in brackets? What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. That is an incredible picture, isn't it? What we have here 
is a reminder of who Jesus is, the one who descends in love, God's very embodiment of redeeming love in our midst, into the world that we know to be with us but also for us. He himself has conquered sin and evil and death itself at the cross. And rising from the, from the grave, vindicated, he ascends to heaven, to the right hand of God. Get this, though. As he ascends, there's this incredible outpouring of gifts as he goes. That's the vision that we're given here. That's the vision that we're given. Notice that Paul is somewhat misquoting Psalm 68 here. He's at liberty to do that because he sees a connection on the one hand, but with a difference. In Psalm 68, there's this uh, picture of God as a kind of warrior, right? taking captives and receiving tribute from the captives. He's defeated Israel's enemies and so on. That's kind of the vision that we're given in Psalm 68. But notice here, it's Jesus that ascends on high. And he took captive, many captives. Captivity itself he takes captive, Paul says elsewhere. And gave, gave gifts to his people. Not received them himself, but gave gifts. Out of this great, overflowing generosity that God has for us. And notice, as he gives these gifts, why? It's to fill all things in the world with his presence and his love. Signs of generosity everywhere. That's an amazing, amazing picture, isn't it? Just in those short verses, we have the entire gospel. If we just spent long enough, paused there, dwelt there, and noticed what, was all, what it was all about. But really, Paul is just tying into something that he's been doing earlier in, in his letter. Next slide, please, Kirsten. In chapter 1, he had begun talking about this grace and this blessing that's been poured out. That's where he begins. And he begins doing that in an opening prayer, which we could think of as a hymn or a poem. And the poem goes on for many verses, verses 3 to 14. And it's one long run-on sentence. Now, I'm an, I used to be an English professor. And looking at that in the Greek, is just heaped up. One preposition after another. One phrase after another. All jammed together. And he failed the grammar test. There's no doubt that Paul failed the gra a grammar test here. But what I love about it is that he gets carried away. It's like he can't help himself. He starts in on this sentence, and then the whole thing rolls. It just keeps rolling. And he can't help but just continue to add on to it. That's what's happening here in the Greek. And it begins this way. Praise be. As a matter of fact, in, in Greek here, it's actually blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What's the common word there? Blessed. It's all blessing. We're wanting to bless God for this incredible blessing that's been poured out for all of us, for all of us. Next slide, please, Kirsten. And then he goes on. And this is where he gets carried away. It's one thing after another. How has he blessed us? How has he done this? Well, he's chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Have you ever been on the sidelines, not noticed, kind of ignored by people? Remember back to those times in school, right, where you were last maybe to be picked for the team, that sort of thing? Hear this. God sees you. He sees me. He welcomes us in. He cares to give you a place, a special place. He chooses you. He chooses me. He not only chooses us, though, he gives us a destiny. A destiny to be in full relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. In accordance, get this, this is hard to believe, with his pleasure. Do you imagine God with pleasure? It's his pleasure to choose you and me to give us a destiny in full relationship with himself. It is his pleasure and his determined will for that to happen. 
not because of anything you and I have done, not because we've shown ourselves to be worthy in some sort of particular way. There's nothing that we've done to merit any of this stuff. Paul just is going on. This is what God has done, not that we are negotiating with God in some sort of contractual way. He has freely given us His glorious grace in the one He loves, that is in Jesus that He loves. He has given freely. Bestowed is, is the way we have it in many of our translations. It's actually the word for grace turned into a verb. It's the word for grace turned into a verb. Isn't that interesting? So He's graced us. That kind of sounds a little archaic though, doesn't it? But try, try to capture the spirit of it, just that abundant, overflowing, unmerited favor that he just loves, loves to show people like you and me, believe it or not. Believe it or not. It's hard to accept, isn't it? Do you always like yourself? Mm. That's the hardest thing of all. This is the hardest thing of all, isn't it? We struggle to like our own selves. How could God like us? and care about us in such a profound way like this. Next slide, please. He goes on and it rolls. In Him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is one of the reasons why we have a hard time liking ourselves, because we kind of know the icky stuff in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in our relationships. It's a struggle, isn't it? But guess what? There's forgiveness of sin in Christ, for all of that, for our guilt and our shame and everything at the core that we struggle with often, it's all there. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, there's the language of grace again, get this, that he lavished on us. That's an interesting word. Paul uses it a number of times, and this is one of the places he uses it. What do you hear when you hear the word lavish? That's exuberance. That's like way beyond what you could imagine or expect or really what's needed. Like God is doing more. He's over-delivering. He over-delivers on all of this stuff that we're talking about. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will. All this stuff that we're talking about, God has made known all of that. We get to talk about it on a Sunday morning in the 21st century because we have God's word. And we're able to celebrate this, appreciate it, and to celebrate it together. This has all been made known, this particular mystery, all these things. And here's that word again, mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. It's his pleasure to reveal himself to us in exactly this way, which he purposed in Christ. And all of this to be put in effect when the times reach their fulfillment, not just now, we have a taste now. We have a sense of it now, but guess what? It's going to be carried to completion. And God is going to bring unity in all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. All of this is going to come to an amazing conclusion where, when heaven and earth will be united together. And we have a part in all of that. We're at the heart of it. This is God's work, but we actually have a part to play in how all that happens just by virtue of receiving these good things, and becoming a little sign of God's goodness and grace in the world. And love, God's very love, can flow in and through us as we become open and receptive to the way that he works. Got it? That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does this have to do with maturity? What does all of this have to do with maturity? Because that's where Paul goes in the very next verses in chapter 4. We're in chapter 1 right now. In our reading, he's going to start talking about maturity, the very next thing. What in the world does all of this have to do with maturity? Next slide, please. Maturity can be a hard thing, right? Even the word itself. What does it, how does it make you feel? One word, do you have a word that you can yell out right now? How does the language of maturity and growing up? Sorry? Old. Old. Yes, okay, fair enough. Responsible, you got to be responsible. Wise, okay, good. In control, that's a really interesting 
idea that maturity would cause you to think of being in control. Other things. Responsibility, Responsibility yes. Uh, painful. How many of us really want to adult in our lives? Most of us in this room are adults. <laughs> but it's hard work, isn't it? <laughs> Don't we want to break from adulting once in a while? After all, it's hard work precisely because of the responsibilities that we feel and that we need to ensure that we've got maybe a measure of control in our lives and so on and so forth. Here's the thing, in our particular culture especially, maturity is about becoming independent and achieving a, a kind of control in your life and you then become admired for the way that you're able to do that. It's like we're constantly over an entire lifetime building a resume to show that we've got our act together right? That's maturity, isn't it? And you can hear it implied in this version that we have from Brian Tracy. I had fun just, you got to be careful on the internet, of course, you know, when you're searching around. Um, but I, maturity, I, and quote, I put in Google and all kinds of stuff comes at you, right? But one really interesting common thread that runs through it all is really just this kind of individual autonomy that we come into. That's the goal, is to be an, an autonomous individual right? Taking ownership for our own lives. And it can be stressful. There is a word maybe that we might associate with maturity too. It can be stressful because how many of us feel like we're up to the task after all? Especially depending on the circumstances that you find yourself in that can throw you sideways and it's like, now how am I going to show that I've got my act together? Yeah, yeah. I think that Paul is giving us a very different picture of what maturity looks like in life, but also, and maybe most especially in the Christian life. Next slide, please. The kind of maturity that Paul is talking about is rooted and grounded in God's love that holds us secure no matter what we go through, and we never leave that behind. We only go deeper with it. We only go deeper with God's love. Rather than moving away from dependence, we, we just go deeper in dependence on God. And we become more of ourselves as we do that, but we go deeper into relationship with other people too. So it's not just about becoming individuals separated from other people. That's not the goal of maturity in Paul's sense here. It's actually that we become more connected in a loving way in relationship with each other as we live out of this love that comes to us from God, pour it out in incredible blessing beyond measure. As we live out of that, we mature and grow into people who are passing on God's love every way, everywhere they go. We might not be able to say, yes, I've now finally got my act together, but we can be assured that we are held secure as we, as we take part. So, Paul goes on to say, Christ himself gave, oh, there's that language of giving again, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people. That's you. It's also me. It's us for works of service. Earlier on in the same chapter, those works of service look like humility, patience, bearing with one another in love, this kind of thing giving of ourselves exactly in the way that Jesus gives his life for us. This is what we're talking about, works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity. There's that language of unity again that God is bringing about, not just in our own lives, but in the whole cosmos, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. There's maturity, there it is. Attaining to the Full, the whole measure of the fullness of, of Christ. Isn't that interesting where maturity shows up? It shows up right in the context of God pouring out his love for us and equipping us for a certain kind of life grounded in his love. And all of this enables us to take part in what God is up to rather than charting our own direction, our own reality, and making sure that we're in control of that, we're able to fend off the wolves and all the rest, 
we are participating in a reality that God himself has brought about. And this is how that works. And it's called maturity, my friends. It's called maturity. Notice where I show up there. I don't know, right? I would be one, maybe one of those leaders, a pastor or a teacher, right? And you might think to yourself, oh, well, you're one of those special people who, who kind of does everything on our behalf. Notice that's not what this is about, is it? What's my role here? I'm here to help equip you and me in these works of service that we together might participate in unity, the very unity that has been achieved in Christ, but we get to participate in, partly as a sign, a foretaste and a sign of things to come to everyone around us. Mm. That's what this good life is all about that we've gotten ourselves caught up in. Did you know? Did you know that that's what it's all about? That's an adventure, though. Next slide, please. Paul goes on a little further. Speaking the truth in love. Oh, there's the language of love again. Truth really matters, but notice that it's allied to love here. Right? So it's not about coming at each other with the truth. Paul has just talked about how it's really easy to be tossed to and fro. Well, hold on, this person and then that person and that, that view and this perspective over here and all the rest. We want to be people of truth, but we want to be people of truth who bear that out in love for other people, deep love for other people, rather than animosity and antagonism, right? That's not the kind of thing that we want to be participating in. So we speak the truth in love, and as we do, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. Notice it's the mature body and not just the mature anthemer the mature Joe Latham, right? The mature Kaya, the mature Grace. It's the mature body, the mature community. Now, we all have a part to play in that, but as members rather than individuals among other individuals, we have a part to play in all of this happening. From him, the whole body, from him, not you and me, but from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up, what in love, as each part does its work. How about that? That's a different kind of maturity, isn't it, than maybe we're accustomed to. You know, when we were in Ireland together, it was so, it was so wonderful, the four of us finally getting together. I'll say this, though, it was tricky. We had a couple of tricky days. We had a couple of tricky days. And it was all around issues of maturity. And I will confess this aloud to you. It's not what you think. Not my daughter's maturity, but my maturity. Because guess what? We're never done. And I'll tell you this, the anxiety and fear that I can feel from time to time around issues of maturity, maybe you can relate to this. I can behave badly with impatience, with a lack of humility, not bearing with, but having too much instruction. Are you with me? But you know what I'm forgetting in moments like that? I'm forgetting God's great love, which holds us secure no matter what. And I'm behaving in relationship to my kids and, and to others potentially too, as if we're all hanging in the balance and that God really doesn't care. And we have to somehow show ourselves approved to him. Somehow we gotta, we got to show that we've got our act together to him so that he'll be able to deeply ingrain stuff. That's the essence of sin, my friends, is running your whole life like that in fear and anxiety. So it's so good. In these particular moments that we had on the road to remember that we're held secure in God's love. And guess what? It changed everything. It changed how we related to one another through the whole rest of the trip. And rather than, than throwing everything sideways, we were able to, okay, come into a better track together and to renew ourselves and all the stuff that matters. This is what I care about for you this morning and for me too, that we would renew ourselves in all of the basics that we know and trust it, bank on it, enter in with trust and faith, make good on it in our lives. This is the adventure that we're called to, and it's a good one. It's a really, really good one. 
And God wants to be intimately present to us by his spirit in the midst of it all, leading us on. He really does love us. Amen.